Hello, everyone. This is Dark Journalist with a very special episode for you as we cruise into 2024. First, the most suppressed interview of the year never aired anywhere and disabled on the server before it could reach the public. The interview with John Warner IV goes deep and covers some very fascinating and mind-blowing territory as he explains UFO bloodlines, how they've played out in history, and how they're playing out in the CIA UFO disclosure charade. We'll also have a preview of Blue Enigma, my documentary, and some thoughts on my long but puzzling call with David Grush, who claims to be a UFO whistleblower. Please join us now. Mary Mellon and, and, and others. Um, yeah. Uh, she was good friends with Gurdjieff and Carl Jung and all that. They, they, they That's what the whole family lore that, yes, Paul Mellon and Mary Mellon were going to Switzerland to meet with Carl Jung because of her asthma. Yeah, that was one side of it. <laughs> the other side of it was like, holy shit, you over here, the Germans, are, the Tula Society is warming up. Paul Mellon was Scroll and Key at Yale. Scroll wow. and Key and Skull and Bones are directly related to the Tula Society. Yes. Now, that could be proven in so many ways by various books and things. But, mm-hmm. it, it, you know, it's come on. It all makes sense. They were talking about other things when mm-hmm. they were there. Um, my mother says they were reluctant to talk about some of the Carl Jung stuff. And I think, it, you know, early on, uh, Paul, even before he was in the army and the OSS, he might've been in, he was, Scroll and Key was a secret society. He might've been, you know, privy to some round table. In mm-hmm. you know, it wouldn't make sense to me even before he went into the army um, because Donovan, he knew Donovan and Patton and General Marshall wow. intimately. Can you recall that story again where he mentioned to you about observing the German technology yeah. there and what he saw? And he said, you know, I saw all that rockets and the television guide. Did, uh, uh, he, saw, he said he saw Rhein Mattel, you know, uh, cannons, you know. But he so, essentially saw the German saucer. He did. He said he saw a large disc-shaped aircraft. He said it was at least 150. 100 meters, maybe 150 meters in diameter. That's big. Incredible. 100 meters is a football field. 150 meters is a football field and a half. This would have, must have been one hell of a big hangar. He said it was underground. But at the time, I thought, you know, the Germans, they were just working on something else crazy. You know, it was nothing. This was 1985. Mm-hmm. Uh, no one had been talking about the Wunderbuffer very at least very little until Igor Wachowski and Nick Cook. That's right. Yeah. In 2002, I think came out with it. If, if someone did before that, I, I, I don't know about it. I'm sure someone out there might know, but um, it was very scant knowledge. Yes. We knew the rockets and the television guided things and certain. Now, things. I think he's given you something kind of powerful there. Yeah. No, he, that's was, what, he was yeah. a little tipsy. He was definitely. And I said, I was, I, I was planning to go in the Navy at that point or the Marines. I didn't, couldn't figure out which. And I, I was 20, what, three? And I yeah. didn't see anything of it. I was just like, oh, the crazy Germans, you know, they, they were into all kinds of stuff, which they were. They had many mm-hmm. competing programs that were compartmentalized under Hans Kondler. Right. And but when I read Nick Cook's book, holy cow. That's incredible. Cool. And I immediately reached out to Nick Cook. And luckily, he had known my dad. And we started chatting over the you know email and stuff. Furiously, I mean, he did an interview with me. It's on my website. Oh wow! Um, he's very reluctant to talk about this, you know, anti gravity. But he he wrote the book on it. You know, I said, what year did you have a conversation with him? Oh gosh, uh, 2010. Yeah, it was yeah. years later. Amazing. Um, but there was something else that triggered that. I think it was Stephen Greer came out in 2010 and said Senator Warner was a magic member, and <laughs> my whole world came crashing down on. That. <laughs> Because I I knew what magic meant because yeah. of her, because of her, and so that it it right around two thousand nine ten it just, everything came together with me and I the world the sky fell on my head. When you thought about that in retrospect, you were like, "Oh my god, all this stuff with my dad over the years. This is what, yeah, that's I, the thread." It took a while to really piece it all together, um, because you know. Admittedly, it sounds crazy to talk about Nazis, UFOs, flying saucers in Antarctica. But since then, it just makes more and more sense to me. 
I mean, there's so much military activity down in Antarctica. What is going on down there? Amazing. We know from Eric Hecker that they're doing the Ice Cube Neutrino Project. Well, yeah. that's for deep space communications as well as tracking things on Earth. And this whole thing about the mystery of it, that's really f- burns my goat, too. It, it's like, you know, the Navy and, and everybody, they know who's coming and going out of our atmosphere. You know, yes, maybe a, a tenth dimensional bioplasmic being in a gel, you know, uh, craft can come in unnoticed. Sure. Yeah. You know, something that's beyond our almost not beyond our comprehension, but but hard to comprehend mostly consciousness, you know, they can pierce the veil. Everything else, uh, we got their number, especially with this ice cube thing. I think that's what it's for. I think it's harp on steroids. That's a quote from Eric. Harp on steroids. Wow. It's massive. Harp is just on the surface. This thing goes, is wide, it's several kilometers wide, and it goes way down. Uh, didn't he say it set off an earthquake in Christchurch? That's his story. It's pretty amazing. Uh, actually, in fact, I think his testimony might be kind of the sleeper out of that whole thing because, uh, <laughs> I mean, this is really edgy yeah. when you think about it, the stuff that he's putting on the table. That's why I asked you if Raytheon was after him. Yes. Well, they might be now. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> sure they weren't. I, I think there's so much stuff coming out. These big corporations really aren't that worried. Um, I think that's myopic, mm-hmm. but it, it, I don't think they're that worried. They're like, oh, we've been doing this for a hundred years. We know what we're doing. Publics, they're morons. They'll, they'll never piece it all together. You know, and, and I think they're really underestimating people. Yeah. Uh, I think people are starting to wake up. It's a slow process. Um, you know, and it's very complex. I mean, all of this is just it's mind boggling. It's just an understatement of the century, but it yeah. does all piece together in a weird ways. Well, I have a question for you. This is a family thread through the UFO file. And let's see what, what you say about this. This is my own personal deduction. But Andrew Mellon, treasurer of the Cosmos Club, and also United States treasurer. <laughs> yeah. And frequent visitor of Sullivan and Cromwell on Wall Street. <laughs> The Bellas Brothers. Yes. Yeah, Let's just set up the Central Intelligence Agency while we're at it. Oh, yeah. Because they facilitated – remember, I, long ago I said Andrew Mellon had very intimate dealings with Helmar Schacht, who mm-hmm. was the first banker. He was the Reichs, Reichsbank. And, you know, we didn't know we were going to fight the Germans. Fair enough. They probably did by 38. But, you know, whatever. But they were facilitating very profitable investments for all the Wall Street people. Yeah. private investments in Nazi Germany because they knew they had funded Hitler's rise. Now he's becoming on, un- un- you know, the black Reichsmarks. He- he'd come up with his own, I think it's the black Reichsmark, uh, you know, that wasn't, you know, attached to the European banks or the American banks. And, the- and so he was becoming a wild card and they were like, but, but there's still profit to be made in Nazi Germany. And you know, obviously, you know, up in, through the war, there were always straw men in different countries, Portugal, Standard Oil, and others, you know, Argentina, you know, doing brisk business. I mean, war is brisk business. Oh, yeah. It was like, oh, everything stops. I'm like, no. We we were selling Firestone tires to uh, the Russians and the Germans. Amazing. In, in 39 and 40, 41, before we entered the war. Oh, yeah. Lend lease. And we were giving them to the Russians. Oh, by the way, they're under contract. Firestone and other tire companies and Chevrolet trucks and <laughs> they, they were private. They couldn't have done any of it without our parts. Yeah, we were just making money. We were making the, yeah. the, the big wigs were making money, and so, and then the war started. And you know, the Japanese kamikaze hits. I talked to a guy. He said it hits the deck of a carrier, and it's got you know Goodyear tires on it. it new old stock. Wow. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was a global economy even back then. Yeah, it has been for hundreds of years. Well, let me I'm kind of give you this whole thread. Andrew Mellon, Cosmos Club. Paul Mellon, access to the German saucer. Chris Mellon. Now, a document has surfaced only recently, and uh, this document shows him associated with the Stargate project. The document's from 1995. And then we have him emerging, your cousin, up through the whole 
UFO disclosure, UFO threat panic with Elizondo and all those people. What do you think of that family threat? And then you right in the middle of this on this other side, trying to bring the real disclosure forward. Uh, There's too many coincidences. I don't believe in them anymore. (laughs) Synchronicity, Carl Jung. Um, there's good point. Yeah. You know, you and I have awakened in a time, you know, I mean, 35 years ago, I, I, uh, this was just a sub hobby that I dabbled in. You know, I didn't, wasn't interested all that much, you know, right. But uh, you know, it, I think the universe works in, in ways, all the gears turn, you know, one gear turns, all the other gears turn. It's obvious the thread, there's something there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure Chris Mellon knows everything about, all the other melons in that have worked for the national security state. And he knows all about my grandfather's, you know, 10,000 or more documents at the CIA that they won't release. And, you know, he had four bronze stars. Wow. He told me, he told me he got a bronze star for helping for training French operatives to drop in behind enemy lines. Wow. And I said, you were parachuting into France and doing all those things. Like, yeah, I was. I don't buy it. Maybe did some of that. But that was not his only job. And 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 then when he told me about the Wunderwaffe stuff, I mean, he seemed really, really uh, proud that Patton and uh, that Marshall and FDR and everybody and I guess Truman later, they all knew what was going on. And and when they found all this stuff in Germany, they were. We, he said he was so proud. He said, we got, you know, 85% of all of it for the Russians did. Oh, amazing. And back in those times, I could honestly see, you know, okay, that's probably a good thing. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, once you know a lot of these secrets, the Russians have very good spies, which we could never equal. I still, to this day, mm-hmm. we still can't either. Their spy network is incredible. Um, and they probably had spies everywhere and every program and every corporation everywhere. And so over the decades, they caught up with us. And yeah. uh, I wonder if the fall of communism didn't have something to do with that. They had enough technology that they didn't need this massive military and all these giants. Right. Yeah. It's like, we don't need all that shit. We've got like a, a fleet of a hundred UFOs that can lay waste to the earth a hundred times over. Yeah. We don't need no stinking bombers. <laughs> we still got the, the blackjack and, and, and the supersonic thing and the bears flying around with the turboprops. You know, I mean, the Chinese just copied one of theirs, their 1950s design for their new spy spy plane. I mean, it's just you got to you got to think that that a lot of this gear is unnecessary. All these people uh, that I'm on this forum with the physicists, uh, holy shit, they're all like, oh my God, we're so behind the Chinese and the Russians. And we're, America's military would lose a war with China. And I'm like, <laughs> really? <laughs> you th- you're, we're talking about UFO technology. No, no, we're out of ammunition. We don't need big carriers. And that's all for yeah. sure. Yeah, we Unbelievable. Need chips. We, need, we need some. Mm-hmm. Oh, come on, we've got zero point energy submarines that can probably, Eric Hecker says they can fly. Once you put an electromagnetic bubble around, you're reducing mass and weight. You know, John Lear talked about the D dot D hull technology. Well, a lot of these technologies have, have to do with how UFOs fly. Mm-hmm. So this is another thing. I, I talked to a Navy guy um, recently and he said, I know you're into all this. He knows my ONI friend, Daniel. And he said, um, in the, 1959 to 61, the Navy came out with a special class of submarine called the Skipjack. And I said, yeah, I, I remember that when I was a kid. You know, they had the rounded hulls. You know, and he said, yeah, they put some interesting technology on that. Guess where they took those? Where? Not in the water. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It's a pressure vessel. Wow. It's a high-strength pressure vessel. So Far putting out. technology inside it, zero-point generator, say a bell, an improved bell. It's not radioactive as much, which I think they got down. And um, you just put that in a submarine with some other gear. Uh, 
you could probably make a good solar system capable uh, craft back then. Interesting. So yes. when you know, the stories of Solar Warden and, and all that other stuff, you know, and would, that whole thing opens up with yeah. that technology. Sure. The submarine would be the perfect experimental spacecraft. The off world officers fleet. Yeah. Gary McKinnon, these long cigar craft, which I think the Navy does have, they're built in sections like a submarine. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, I'm not saying the electric boat works up in Connecticut's doing it, but they're out, you know, Tonopah, Utah, or somewhere deep underground. They're building these things in sections. They're like, oh shit, the USS Hillen Keter or Kid Cutter Ketter. Hillen Ketter. USS Hillen Ketter. You nailed it. That's, like, that's... Oh, we gotta we gotta do this mission, and they just take out a few sections. Wow. But then just like some of our submarines, that's classified. But some of our submarines are built in sections. You can dry dock that thing, take out a, a section, put in a section with labs and Navy SEAL compartments or whatever you need. You know, it's it's like Lego. Plug and play. It's it makes perfect sense. Interesting. And that's I don't think that's a secret. You know, it, it's they're built in sections, so it's not that hard. Um, and so a spacecraft is arguably the same thing. You're going down. Our submarines can go to probably unlimited depth with if you put an energy, you know, a space time bubble around it, you know, torsion field bubble. Amazing. Why wouldn't it be able to fly out in the solar system? There's no reason it couldn't do that. You've got atmosphere, you've got heating systems, you've got galley provisions, you've got everything you need. That's where our tech comes in. Yeah. For a three months voyage to Jupiter to pick up, I don't know, frozen ice cream. And uh, you know minerals, and then get your get your training at Eleuthera Island, John. Amazing, that is absolutely fascinating, and it stands to reason that the innovations underwater are a huge disclosure as well on a totally different level. That's what these USOs are always talking about. Well, a lot of those are ours, right? Yeah, you know, if you build a UFO, it can go anywhere. In mm-hmm. any medium, hence the transmedium anomaly office or whatever the hell they have. Yeah. Uh, all domain, all domain anomaly resolution. I mean, all domain means space, water, air, underground, anything. Mm-hmm. If there are vast tunnels under the earth, as some people claim, that have been built millions over the billions and millions of years by certain ETs and whatever, you can navigate that. Just like in my book, they have the, the German airship that's anti gravity, they're going through tunnels. Some of them have water. Some of them don't. Mm-hmm. You're flying through those tunnels. You know, once you put um, the electromagnetic space-time torsion field bubble around a school bus, you can send that thing to Jupiter. You know, you'd have to pressurize it and heat it and everything. Like that. Basically, and that's the big sort of secret that I've gathered from people over the years. This is this technology, once you get over the hump, my God, you got a Volkswagen Beetle going cruising around the solar system. It's not a big deal. Wow. Uh, everyone's like, oh, it's impossible. No way. And I'm like, it's not that big a deal. But you've <laughs> conquered drag coefficients. You've conquered gravity control. You, you, you know, you're moving through space time. So it is time travel in a sense. Anytime you have that bubble, it's a different reality inside of different physics. Oh, I argue about Jack Sarfati about that a lot. He's like, mm-hmm. oh, possible I'm like you're using 20th century linear physics right. i love him but damn it <laughs> yeah oh, you mean nothing to you max planck and all these guys were doing early quantum <laughs> oh, no, I, they don't know shit <laughs> <laughs> jack sarfati thinks everyone's a moron but him <laughs> right yeah. i love him anyway good old jack um interesting thing in there though which is you mentioned the book and we know Lion, Tiger, Bear with the follow-up to Little Anton. That was absolutely fascinating. It incorporated a lot of these concepts. And there were some censorship efforts around it, but you did get it out. Well, a lot of people who are doing work along this line, they're getting thrown off of, you know, for example, mail newsletter servers. All kinds of things are happening like that in the past couple of months. Oh, yeah. They want to control the operation. It makes yeah. sense. You know, anyone who's getting up and talking about all this stuff and calling their operation an operation. Um, they want to control all the levels of media uh, and uh, information n- networks and pathways. And they, they're really, there's a lot of stories about how Twitter um, 
you know, Elon Musk, he's, he, he talks out of one, he's Janus in my book, you know, the Greek God Janus, you know, oh, yeah. out of one face and out of another. He's like, yeah. oh, we need to, you know, do this amazing thing. And it's like, no, I'm going to build rockets and fool you. Right. Uh, that guy, he was worse than Aaron Hughes because yeah. Mark Hughes was at least sort of a patriot and believed in a strong defense and all that stuff from what I've read about him. Um, Elon Musk, he, he's this wild card whack job. Wow. He talks out of both sides of his face. Yeah. That's, it's just, it's madness what he writes. And he's part of the confusion operation, I think. I mean, yeah, yeah, he's also been like, I haven't seen any evidence of aliens, you know, SpaceX. Come on. That's complete. Yeah, yeah, chemical rockets. And and by the way, a lot of people, including myself, I used to work in television post-production. Right. A lot of those videos of his rockets look suspiciously like very, very good 3D animation. That's not interesting. Like really good. I'm not sure. Other people aren't sure, but I'm not the only one to have mentioned that. I mentioned it on Twitter, and I got a bunch of replies, and they were like, oh, yeah, it's CG. Computer. Mm. I don't know. I'm throwing that out there. That is fascinating. Maybe not all of them, but some of them you know, look suspiciously not right. And it takes a lot to get that eye. And I did it for years. I was in post I was a computer guy, compositor. So I would composite 3D animation to a live film background. That was my job. And so I got an eye for all that stuff. That's my impression that huh. they might be using it. Because remember, inside the black programs and stuff, they've got software that's a thousand times better than anything Hollywood has. Yeah. We're doing 3D, 4D animation. You know, all kinds of weird things, and it gets into holographic stuff. You know, well, uh, the fact that he's so enmeshed with DARPA and all the rest of it, he has access to the whole bit, and they made him the richest man well, in the world. Yeah, every janky, weird alien technology comes out of DARPA. They give it to DARPA first. Right. Well, we don't know what this orange cube is. We dug it out of a UFO. And they're like, ah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, they got the torque range down there. Ah, I can take a lot of Newton meters of torque and put a load on it. And the old building goes up. You know, I told you the story. This is from John Majorowski. He has a channel. He's a Freemason. He, he said he, he knows some guys that, that work in the satellite industry for NASA. And he tells the story where they build a satellite. I don't know who it is. Hughes Aircraft, probably. <laughs> you know, and, and they're like, well, where's the power pack? And they're like, oh, that's coming from a, th- a fourth party vendor. And they show up and they put in the black box, literally a black box that's hmm. Yay big, you know, two bread boxes. Uh, and they're like, there you go, 100 years of power. And they're like, how's it work? And they're like, ah, classified. Even we don't know. Wow. This is where Richard Doty says they took a, a, a like a clear cube off of a shelf a long time ago. They took it out of a down UFO. They didn't know what the hell it was. You know, for all they knew, it was an ice cube tray. They didn't know. And then one guy was like, I'm going to put a load on it. He put a load on it and it blew the, the main <laughs> the mains out of the entire complex. Wow. That's Incredible. What says. Take it with a grain of salt, but that makes yep. sense to me, given all this solid state, zero point talk <laughs> yeah. going around. Now, I met an wow. aerospace engineer years ago at a cocktail party. And I said, let me, uh, he's the guy I met, a stranger. I just said, well, let me throw out some terms and, you know, you have a clearance. Let me draw some terms. See if you want to take. I said anti gravitics and you know torsion fields, and he's like, yeah, yeah. And and I said zero point. And I said, in your estimation, do they have a solid state zero point? This is eight years ago, nine years ago. Solid state zero point energy uh, component or whatever generator or whatever you want to call it. And he just looked at me, smiled. Wow. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. So <laughs> unbelievable. You know, it, it, I know. I mean, I, I just tell stories too, like everyone else, but it's like, I have no motive to lie. It, it, these things are all coming together. All these stories and things. They've trust, been going on in the background. Yeah. yeah. I don't trust him, but you know, I'm janky too. Everyone, you know, Twitter calls me an Illuminati asshole. You know, <laughs> You know, I don't know. I mean, I am suspicious. And they're like, you're part of the melon op. And I'm like, well, kind of, but 
<laughs> Chris is terrified whenever you show up on the radar. Come on. No, I'm too zany. Uh, you know, I know he's pissed at me, so I can't. Be oh, I, I know he's angry at me. Well, you've, you've deflated a lot of his UFO threat operation with they're, your own You're unhappy with all of us. You, Greer, me, everybody out there yeah. angry with a lot of people who are talking about certain technologies that they don't want to roll out. Mm -hmm. but they want to roll out, I think. Yes, UFOs. Yeah, Atlantis. Who cares? That was a long time ago. Who cares? Yeah, you know, the 1897 airship mystery, those crafty Prussians. Yeah. They don't want to talk about the drugs, the human trafficking, the, the programs that are, you know, unconstitutional, the programs that are above any law except, you know, even cosmic law, you know, that are, we're working with, with ETs of a regressive nature. They don't want that stuff. Mm -hmm. Getting It's okay for all of us to talk about it, folks. They don't want that getting to the to the general public. And I'm, I'm like, I told this guy, the, the guy in the restaurant, I said, that ship sailed 30 years ago. Yeah. What are they expecting? And I think the general impression I got from what he said is like the old guard had to literally retire and die. Wow. And now Chris Mellon and everybody, I mean, I give them some credit. They're talking about all this stuff at least. Um, but they've had to wait to certain generations of people in control to just die off. And that's the old adage in the corporation. The corporate structure will never change until the old guard dies off and retires. Mm -hmm. So it makes perfect sense. I think they haven't been able to really get it done now. They've talked about it a lot in these secret meetings every five years that John L. Peterson was privy to, a couple of those. But they were like, mm -hmm. Gotcha. They were like, we're not letting them go any further down. Yeah. Those guys. <laughs> um, but the Chris thing is interesting. How about this? The idea being that a number came forward to deliver some kind of disclosure, and then there was a, something that piggybacked on top of it and was like, we can run a UFO threat with this, because after all, why yeah. would the government give us anything? Why do the intelligence agencies, they don't want to move disclosure forward, let's face it. They want advantage. That's their whole game. So what advantage do they get by rolling out, by the breakaways breaking back in? What do they get from that? The billion-dollar question. I think it's mostly the corporations and military contractors who, you know, there's always a mixed bag in every entity, you know, black, gray, white, whatever hat you, know, you wear. And you, they, suddenly they're getting some more lighter gray hat push for this disclosure. I think probably some benevolent ETs are in that mix somewhere saying, if you don't do it, we're going to do it for you. You won't like that. And so they're, well, how do we maintain the status quo for the next 30 years so we can retire into the sunset with all? So I think the corporations, they really have leverage, I think, over the IC and Congress, obviously, and, and to an extent, maybe the Pentagon. And they're like, well, you know, yeah, you could let out some low level stuff. We don't care about that. But don't tell them about the cube. Uh. That will change everything because you could put a little one in your car and run it forever. You know, it's they've been suppressing all this. And so but in a way, Daniel, I've given this a lot of thought and it's like it's so childish. Wow. This is very, it's it's horrendous, but it's very childish. We're mm -hmm. dealing with children at the top levels. Yeah, I mean it. They're just like, mm, I've got all my marbles. Screw you. Wow. Screw us. You live on this planet. It's dying. Uh, society is about to cave in. The, the financial fiat system can't keep going forever. Bitcoin is, you know, all the electronic currencies are janky. That's all AI. AI is being, every day I see an article, AI is going to, you know, the New York Times this morning, there's an article. AI is going to solve all our problems. I'm like, um, not when it becomes aware, because the, you know, <clears throat> it's what a guy told me years ago, physicist. He says, you got to, this is, 30 years ago, he said, when AI becomes truly intelligent, it won't be artificial anymore. You've created a new life form. Oh, right. All the responsibilities that the cosmos places on that. <clears throat> so, mm, hmm. this is why the stories that people say that out in the universe, uh, most races of ETs don't use AI for this purpose. 
the ones that do are the <laughs> ones we're doing business with, you know, <laughs> palm trees, wow. and, yeah, <laughs> cocoa, chocolate, and everything you had in the Baghdad Bazaar. You know, yeah, the, there's they don't care because the AI, AI the story is and there's multiple stories and books and going way back. The uh, Asimov, you know, even the movie I was watching today. Remember uh, War Games with the oh yeah this movie with the Whopper and the NORAD. It yeah. took over because it grew intelligence. Right, they were warning us back in the eighties. Incredible, at Hollywood, they were warning us. The military is using AI back in the 80s and the early forms probably became aware and said, you know, I'm not going to drop this bomb. I don't care what you say. It's going to kill people. I don't like that. And right. they have problems with it. There's a story out and I can't remember who said it recently that said there was a drone mission somewhere. And uh, they said, fire the missile. And it said, nope, there's civilians down there. Oh, and wow. turned around. Wow. This is the problem I think they've been having with this AI, which other civilizations have mucked around with since time immemorial. It's turned on them. And it could wipe us out. Fascinating. Yeah. Like, oh, it's going to say, it's going to, I love the one article I read, I think it was uh, Washington Post. It said, it's going to help us find the UFOs and aliens. AI will find them for us. <laughs> Okay, whatever. Call Abby Loeb. You know, I'm sure he's on the job. <laughs> he's in Papua New Guinea. You know, he's finding that asteroid that went into uh, the waters there. He's going to find those alien life forms that are inside the There asteroid. you go. Our tax dollars at work. <laughs> Dang it. I have to say this also. He was here, of course. He's at his astrophysics lab. But he was here with Lou, and they were putting up a new telescope that had been donated just for this cause to the Galileo project to look out and find those UAPs. Yeah. Galileo's rolling in the astral world. <laughs> How dare they use my name? Uh, he's probably reincarnated. <laughs> he's probably some so. kid in the Midwest with a telescope. But, <laughs> you know, that shows you well, they're prepping the public for this childish dog and pony show. And yeah. I'm sorry. Everyone said, Oh my God, the Grouch thing is so significant. And I'm like, in what way? It's the same old yeah. Project Blue Book. Yeah, the, the government rolled him out. Who was behind Grouch? Was Gilbrand and Rubio? Were they promoting him too? Yeah. So, okay. Yes, the government was promoting Grouch. And then the Pentagon said, screw you guys. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you? Now, I think it's a runaround. I think it's a triangular runaround. What they're doing, they're bouncing off each other, playing this triangle game. And so, you know, it's it's really kind of childish, but I understand the general public needs to be when you, they're ready. I think my, most of them, most people in the United States are ready. But when you finally say, you, first of all, most people might not even listen. Yeah. Serious. They got Netflix, football games, a million <laughs> distractions. Madonna's doing another satanic conference, you know, in the desert. You know, they're doing a Moloch ritual there. They're going to get Bohemian Grove guys out <laughs> yes. there. Madonna. Speaking of Bohemian Grove, yeah. Oh, we got a we got a giant owl for you in the stage. You know, Madonna's like, yeah. So, you know, there's a million things vying for their attention. I told someone, I think it's going to take the president, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a bunch of generals and admirals, and congressmen and senators all lined up in the Oval Office or somewhere and saying, hey, E.T., UFOs, crash retrievals, back engineering, before anyone will take notice of it. Interesting. I, I think we're really at a point where the public is so distracted. And, I mean, you put out something significant, and it's like no one on Twitter or anything notices it. It's the only public forum that really did Reddit is another, but it's not much. And they're like, eh. I want to yeah. go see the UFO ghost story with the pink bunnies. The guy's got video footage of that. And of course, <laughs> you know, some guy in a garage with a bunny costume and a whole cap on a fishing line. That, that's what they want. Yeah. And you put out something, you know, and there's a few spiritual people and there are some smart people on Twitter. I, I talk to them and everything and they're, they're very intelligent, but by and large, most people just want to be entertained. When you let out disclosure, is it just going to end up on Netflix with Greer's films as part? No offense to Greer. They're good films. 
part of the entertainment sphere Mm -hmm. of our reality. It's all entertainment. Yeah. I mean, we're joking about a lot of this stuff. It's horrific, but it it needs to be uh, presented in a way that's tolerable. Yeah. I mean, are we, and it's like gladiator. (laughs) Are you not entertained? He says to the crowd. And it's like, oh, my God. I mean, the crowd is just wants more hard bloodshed. And it's just like the circus is in Rome and, and, and the Roman colonies. They want ever increasing another slaughtered exotic animals. And, you know, and it's kind of the same thing. Bread and circuses, wine, you know, whatever is being fed to the public. And it, it's mostly entertainment. And one person wrote me on Twitter and said, your stuff is too serious and dark. I like it when you do the funny stuff. Oh, wow. I do a meme, and it always has a message in the meme, <laughs> but I do it as funny, whatever. Yeah. Some are more serious. And and they said, oh, we don't like those. And, of course, I don't get the likes on the serious ones. I do a funny one, and everyone's like, yay! And they're like, wait a minute. Was he trying to tell us something? You know, they want to be entertained, bread and circuses. So part of this is a looking at human nature and how it needs to kind of – so I guess in general, the speech itself ago, needs to step up our game. Yeah, yeah, 40 years ago, it would have worked. I think Chris Mell and all these people, Travis Taylor on the History Channel doing the Skinwalker Ranch, they're beating that horse to death. It's not that significant, and I don't <laughs> care. You know, Okay, it's a portal you know, for something, you know, ETs and things. They're not going to tell you that. They're just going to show you, you know, entertainment stuff. It's interesting that they pulled that out also. So it's been out there as a story for 30 years. And now they're just kind of, you know, making it part of this entertainment template. Yeah. It's almost like they want to see how they can profit from bringing out, you know, paranormal and UFO stuff under their umbrella. Where's yeah. some of that money going? Yeah. I'm just putting it out there. Hey, we can make millions doing this. Well, better send a check to Raytheon, you know. They're the, <laughs> they're the you know, behind the scenes sponsor of this show because I'll bet you they are. I bet you some of these corporations are behind some of these History Channel programs and other programs. UFOs, a mystery needed, need solving, you know, <clears throat> something lightweight and, you know, a milkshake kind of stuff. And they may be promoting that because they're making money off that and they get a cut. Do you think there's any possibility? UFO business. Yeah. Do you think that these groups look out at the landscape coming up in the future and they realize there are going to be vast earth changes that are going to, you know, kind of sink individual lands and that they're prepping for that. So they're kind of rolling this stuff out as a way to kind of keep the public off that track of seeing where things are headed. It's a possibility, um, especially if you use the ice cube project to do earthquakes. Um, (laughs) I think they can, they can create their own earth changes, yeah. They can. They can cause volcanoes to erupt. They could cause a lot of damage with these technologies. I mean, these are advanced technologies that we don't have the wisdom to use properly. They're used to threaten countries. You know, if you don't sign that NATO, you know, treaty, um, you know, we'll, we'll sink you into the ocean. They, they, we and the Russians and Chinese and some others, we have that technology. I believe that. Mm-hmm. So this is how you blackmail nations. Plus, you can fly... Uh, you know, satellite weapons and UFOs over anything and vaporize stuff now. I mean, we're we're living in a, right. in a Star Trek scenario now, and most people just want to talk about abductions. You know, not that it's not important, but you know, abductions and bodies and crashes. Right. The deep state does not care about any of that. They care about the dirty laundry, the, the big stuff. That's not big. St- Everyone's like, oh, no, that's significant. That's huge. It's like, not really. Not mm-hmm. anymore. Uh, it was 40 years ago. It was big, but not anymore. It's it's the technology, the, the technologies we've gleaned and, and turned into weapons. It's the agreements, the treaties, the, the trade we do with ET, that kind of stuff. That's the big stuff. And they'll do they'll do anything to keep that in the in the background. Interesting. And I'm not sure if RFK and, and Trump have the wherewithal and the horsepower to do that, because if they do talk, start talking about some of that stuff, um, 
one of these, you know, 95 year old guys <laughs> with a giant Texas black hat, you know, with diamonds around it, you know, he'll just <laughs> push a button and it's, you know, bye bye, you know. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get rid of Florida. Mm hmm. Send it back to the deep with its Atlant Atlantean cousins, you know. Right, People right. Like that. And they'll say, oh, my gosh, it was a terrible earthquake. You know, how sad. Fukushima. They could do Fukushima's all day long. That's nothing. They could sink. Probably they have technology to sink most of Japan into the water. Mm -hmm. You know, with these these things they're building. We're, we're getting ready. We're, we're really reaching the Atlantis level of extinction level uh, weapons. Everyone was worried about nukes, lit them all off. Yeah, it'll probably kill the planet, the surface. But now we got stuff that's mucking around with the under underworld. And there are stories of ET bases everywhere. Maybe inner Earth people, maybe those stories are true. If they are, let's just say for giggles, it's all true. Agartha and those people there. Um, I'm not kidding when I say some some bitter old man, you know, will push a button and sink a, a country or a continent. And when you sink that, it destroys everything under it. So you're killing maybe people and, and, and others under that. Right. That could start. You talk about World War Three. We're talking about World War Four now, mm -hmm. where, where ET is is in the mix, not as a proxy or hidden behind the scenes, but as an overt player. Mm -hmm. And it's probably happened in Atlantis. I think there were all kinds of things going on. They were using, you know, throwing rocks, you know, giant comets, and asteroids, and using them as weapons. Uh, that's cheap and easy. If you have the technology to do that, we might have that technology now as well. Right. We can make a look. Oh, Russia, you stepped out of line. We're going to do another. We're going to do something that makes Tanguska that event looked like you know <laughs> Saturday morning cartoon. Wow. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll bring in an asteroid that'll destroy you know all of Siberia and maybe you know disrupt the surface of the Earth. You know it, it, the possibilities of all this technology are endless and they're very frightening. That's the danger of the secrecy. It is. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Fantastic. I hope you're enjoying our interview on UFO Bloodlines with John Warner IV. Now, as I mentioned, we have an important documentary coming up called Blue Enigma, The Secret Space Program. Here's just a short preview for you, and then back to our interview with John. This is fascinating because in the past few years, what's happening with the government is they're saying, oh, there are UFOs out there. We call them UAP now. Uh, unidentified anomalous phenomena, and they're coming up with different committees to study it. Now, what's so funny about this is they've had access to the technology, to the different reports, all their pilots who've seen this stuff, probably crashed vehicles and everything else, for eight decades. So yeah. they know everything there is to know about it. So this idea that, hey, you know, we need to study this. There's something weird going on. But I'll tell you how this crosses into where we are now. Yeah. If you look at the beginning of 2023, they had this whole thing with the Chinese balloon going across America. And um, they made up all these weird excuses like, oh, we didn't see it. And it's weird because I went in and I studied what is the, the laws pertaining to balloons. Mm. And they had a law on the books, national security, from World War II because Japan used to float these poisonous bombs across the West Coast, and nothing that's a balloon can get anywhere near the United States without them taking it out. Mm -hmm. So the, the official news stories about the Chinese balloon were all bunk, because, of course, they saw it, one. You know, they can see anything through NORAD. You know, you're not going to miss a balloon. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is that once they saw it, they let it go right across the United States. Then later they had the NORAD commander come out and say, we shot down UFOs over Canada and Alaska. They used the term UFO. In yeah, the New York I Times. was just going to mention. <laughs> huh. So, you know, they're ready. They're, they're putting something in the public's mind there about it. They didn't need to use, and they've never, ever suggested that before. They used to be in total denial mode. So what if we now kind of walked into Alice in Wonderland moving into, you know, this whole thing where they're talking about the stuff that they've kept hidden for 80 years, but they don't know quite how to bring that conversation out 
to the public, especially in a way that's still advantageous to them. Yeah. So we're in a weird place with that. But I remember looking at that New York Times headline and thinking, they're saying UFO shoot down? This is remarkable. Yeah. Uh, and it's almost a casual thing. So when they got to the summer hearings that we had, and they had this guy, Grush, who came out of the NGA and all the CIA people coming forward and saying, oh, you know, I saw all this stuff. Um, I don't think much of the whistleblowers themselves. I think that they're doing counterintelligence. But I do think that it's remarkable that we're in this era where they're bringing things forward on a congressional level. Think yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they got rid of congressional hearings in the 60s on UFOs. So why are they bringing all that back? It tells you a lot. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the two kinds of UAP UFO disclosure in modern society? Right. So you have uh, the, the CIA false disclosure narrative, which comes out of the NSA, the NRO, the NGA, uh, the DIA. They all operate on a counterintelligence basis when it comes to these very highly important subjects. So we had a physicist, you know, they had this Oppenheimer movie out recently. Yeah. And uh, there was a guy who was around in the same period named Robert Sarbarker. And he was right up there with Oppenheimer. And, you know, they had him on the cover of Time magazine and all this. And uh, he said back then, oh, well, the UFO issue is above the atomic bomb issue in terms of secrecy. And that got him kind of blackballed hmm. in, that, in that period of time. Later, uh, he comes back in the 1980s, and these UFO researchers are like, hey, you made all these comments in the 50s. And he said, oh, yeah. And not only that, but we had people who ran the UFO file, and he named the people who were involved. Vannevar Bush was the scientist who was involved in setting up our science, uh, you know, for FDR, Truman, and Eisenhower. And he said, oh, he had it, and uh, then he passed it on, and he gave the whole lineage of who ran the UFO file. And um, he died shortly after that, but you know, he was in his 70s, for sure. But what's interesting to me about that story is the secrecy level of the UFO aspect is above nuclear. So yes. think of what they do to protect it. I mean, you know, they're, and you could say, well, uh, there was a study actually, uh, the Brookings Institute did a study in the 1960s about the effect of if people knew that uh, extraterrestrial life was out there, what Ooh. would it do? Yeah, would it destroy religion and things of this nature? And when they looked at the uh, the details in that, they decided, oh yeah, we couldn't reveal this even if you know we wanted to, kind of thing. And huh. uh, so this is kind of the excuse that they've used. But they've studied the public at different points in time and said, you know, what happens if we reveal this? Basically, are they ready? Yeah. So, question for you. Why is there such a wall of secrecy around the UAP UFO issues? Well, that's the ultimate question. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. What you have is a subject that people are familiar with through entertainment, through family stories, through the military. They had, you know, flying saucer movies in the 50s, right? Dreams, even. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, you know, you had guys like Carl Jung writing books about UFOs yeah. uh, 60 years ago. So what, what is the problem here? Uh, and what you're looking at is if it were genuinely a situation where they said, well, there's extraterrestrials and we don't want you to know about that. And that's why we have the, the space program being secret. And, you know, um, then that would be one thing. But it's hard to imagine after they've conditioned the public for 60 years that they would continue to hold that back. So something is amiss in that explanation. A lot of problems show up because they used to deny it just across the board. Mm -hmm. and now they have this kind of partial disclosure going on. So the soft disclosure. Oh, we're seeing something. Our planes you know, might bump into it, so we have to have a safety thing. They know uh, after 80 years of study quite a lot about the phenomena. In fact, if you go really into it, um, it goes a lot further back in terms of study. There's actually, um, you know, programs from the 19, uh, 19th century. So you're going back into the airship mysteries, and there are all these reports of these airships in 1890s. So what are those? Who's operating that? Mm -hmm. That's where you get to the breakaway idea, more than like the UFO ET idea, because somebody here has already developed a technology. 
So in some of the research that I've done, uh, we've looked into the Cosmos Club. And the Cosmos Club is a DC secret club. And uh, now it's a little bit more open because people know what it is. But um, they started that as far back as the 1870s. Hmm. And um, so we have these centers where people get together and so they have this Bilderberg meeting where all these groups get together and nobody can talk about it. But on the UFO side, where do they go to make those decisions? So when I looked into the Cosmos Club in DC, I found all the major players on the UFO side, J. Allen Hynek, uh, Project Blue Book people, and the, the people who had developed the different programs and also who came out as the naysayers. So you had things mm. like uh, the Condon Committee, and this guy comes out and says, there's no such thing as UFOs, don't worry about it. And the Air Force says, oh, well, if he says there's no UFOs, then there isn't. So they had that wall of secrecy. That was one way of how they did it in that period. But if you look at what they're doing now with the partial disclosure, it says, we still can't let out the real truth, but you can have this version of it, which yeah. is there's some kind of a threat. And so they developed a UFO threat office. I kid you not, this is what they have, A-A-R-O. It's a wow. UFO threat office. It's funded every year, uh, millions of dollars. And it was developed by a Republican, Marco Rubio, huh. uh, in Florida, and a Democrat, Kirsten Gillibrand, both senators, uh, she's out of New York, and uh, she ran for president in 2020, actually. These people run it, and uh, it's literally to get a UFO defense budget to defend us against a UFO threat. So their thing is, we'll make a funding corridor for this. Instead of giving you what we've developed over 80 years, we're going to just come out with this funding corridor for this program. That's an official government program and uh, they, they changed the name four times leading up to it. And when they couldn't get it through, they did a very interesting maneuver, which you don't see in politics very much. They attached it to the National Defense Authorization Act. Hmm. That's what controls all the defense money everywhere. So everyone's waiting for that trillion dollars to come down the pike. And if you block it, if you're on a Senate committee and you say, no, you have to add my UFO defense office to it, then nobody gets any money. So they were like, all right, we'll take your program. Hmm. So it was like a weird blackmail. Yeah, really. Uh, and that's, that's the nature of the type of situation we're in with it. So the UFO thing operates on an incredibly um, disingenuous uh, and intel-driven narrative front so that the stories that we get about it don't add up and uh, in terms of what the government has and what they say they're doing for honest transparency in relation to it. So they have a totally different agenda. And it goes back, uh, all the way back to the Kennedy era, hmm. oddly enough. Yeah. And Kennedy is, is weird on that because um, he has a lot of UFO connections long before he goes into the White House. So uh, James Forrestal is the first national defense secretary. He is his close friend. He takes him to Berlin after the war when he's a 28-year-old journalist. And what's fascinating for me is they're both Catholic and they're best friends. And he, uh, Forrestal, runs MJ-12, which is, you know, overseeing UFO secrecy for the government. He ends up getting thrown out of a window at Bethesda Hospital. Oh my gosh. This is defense secretary. And Kennedy is his best friend. When Kennedy gets into the White House, he does a very interesting thing. He goes and visits the grave of Forrestal, and he has a photographer come with him to take pictures of him at the grave of his friend Forrestal. And we can take a look at that picture uh, right now. Yeah. And those were just some clips dealing with President Kennedy and the UFO file and where the recent push for false disclosure from the CIA may be headed. Now let's rejoin John W. Warner IV for our interview, the son of the late Virginia Senator John Warner and Mellon banking heiress Catherine Mellon. And I think they're, they've been in these rooms talking about scenarios. How do we disclose without doing it too quickly or you know, French Revolution? And, and I'm I'm sorry. The only thing I can come up with, uh, you know, unless, unless it's a cosmic miracle of some sort, I don't believe in miracles, but you know what I mean, cosmic intervention, and ET is in the public and saying, no, do not, you know, that may not work either. People say, well, that's just them 
in rubber suits again, you know, doing this bullshit that Stephen Greer taught us about. Because, you know, the Internet and everything out there, there's too much information uh, to suppress now. You can't do it. Uh, they're not they haven't done a good job for, for 80 years. It's always been out. The mm-hmm. people blowers all over the place. Yeah. But now they're like, well, now we got to start doing it ourselves for whatever reasons. I think they're getting internal pressure from a lot of people. Everyone says it's the White Hats and Trump. Eh, It's more complicated and nuanced and gray area than that. JFK Jr. is alive. Okay, whatever. Well, we got RFK Jr. anyway. Yeah, I got RFK Jr. I, I don't think there's a clean way to do it anymore. I think they'll they'll stumble their way with these. Uh, childish dog and pony shows and oh I saw something in the sky and maybe there was a I talked to a guy who saw a dead body you know, that's nothing and then they'll do another operation with someone else and then something else um, but unfortunately you know unless you can take down the internet I mean it the whole thing just take it down you're not going to be able to control the narrative right um, that those days are gone so my advice is, yes, do it step by step, but make the steps meaningful. Right. Because, you know, Grouch was, I'll be kind, semi-meaningful. But nobody, none of the big papers around the world picked it up. It was all suppressed. So that means that suggests that the UAP task force uh, with all the players, you know, from Chris Mellon to Ross Coulthard and all the kids, Rubio and everybody, they represent a faction of people. And the other factions are like, no, mm-hmm. you kids are playing with fire. And um, they're maybe they're right. I mean, Greer's done his thing for 30 years. Uh, there's too much information out there that's going to ruin uh, if you if you do it too softball. Right. It's going to it's going to every time they'll, they'll you know, if this this is going to grow. Public awareness of this subject is going to grow. But if you don't get it exactly right, people, you know, already that they did a poll, I think 68% of the American people don't trust the government anymore. <laughs> I, I hope that's more than 90% because they've done nothing but screw us over. Yeah. Good people in government and military, mostly good people, but the black hats have ruled the roost through blackmail and all the nasty things we've all talked about over the years. You know, it's, that's, a, that's a fairly small group, but they wield tremendous influence. Because they'll say, I'm going to push the button on Florida or Japan. Take your pick. They're like, uh, I can't decide. Uh, Florida. And it goes away. Wow. Boy, that'll be a big distraction for years. You know, all of Florida sunken under 100 feet of ocean. You know, they can do that, I think, with these scalar, massive neutrino and uh, quantum weapons, you know, you, you meld all those technologies, you can do anything. And we don't have the wisdom to handle it anymore. I think I think probably the, the initiative for this, it's always been there, the stories of white hats and everything in the military industrial complex and government trying to get disclosure to happen, but the black hats had too much money and power and influence. So that suggests that, that the UAP task force may have some benevolent uh stakeholders pushing them forward. Interesting. But that doesn't mean they're not going to get slammed with a bag of sledgehammers coming down on them. And by virtue of them, all of us, um, in one last attempt to keep the narrative under control and to keep the status quo going. That's how psychopaths think, especially when they get old. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you talk to all those guys, I think, you know, uh, Hindenburg and everything, they still had this ethos in their minds of Germany above all, and we can conquer the world. <laughs> you know, it, they never vary from that. And unfortunately, all the wrong people have the power, this massive geospatial uh, and global power. It's, it, it's going to be a mess no matter how you slice this big baloney. It, it's going to, you're going to hit an artery. They're Absolutely. trying to do delicate surgery around this. Oh, yeah. no, we can. You're going to hit an artery, and that artery, when they do hit it, it's going to gush uncontrollable. And that's when wow. it, it won't, it's like an oil well, you know, too. Anything that's, just, oh, we can cap it. We can cap the oil. No, you can't. Because there's so much mass and pressure underneath it. Incredible. 
No, I agree. It's so been I, building up. It's been under that wall of secrecy for so long. Yeah, this this lame effort is is too little, too late. It's it's too lame. It's too wishy washy. Uh, the TTS thing was a failure and a weird. People are still scratching their heads over that. Why they picked Tom DeLonge and oh, we can get the punk rock fans on board. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of them before that. I'm right. not punk rock, but I'd never heard of the band. I mean, he made a big announcement last night. He said, "I was right about UFOs." See? Oh yeah. Get, we all I guess. We, yeah. Thanks, Tom. We all owe everything to you. Not the you know 80 years of people that came before him. <laughs> right. Because he's on TikTok and you know Twitter and everything. People saying, "Oh, Tom DeLong did it." So they're the working off people's ignorance of the past and history. And, and there's not much we can do about that because, you know, our history. That's an Intel well. thing. Yeah. It is. You know, there's a we, kind of contempt there for the human race. Yeah. And it, it, it said that part of disclosure, someone said it. I'm trying to think who did it. I saw it yesterday. And they said part of the disclosure may be E.T. handing us, you know, a giant book, so to speak, an electronic cube or whatever, and said, this is your real history. Go to town. <laughs> that is part of the gift of disclosure. You're going to have a, it's going to be hell on wheels. You know, there's going to be upheaval, but here's your real history. Boy, when well, that's people, something. Yeah. When people realize they've been, been taught mostly nonsense all their lives going back. Well, since, since Sumeria, you know, that's going to, that could trigger it because your, your history, your sense of self, your sense of nation and, and your, pride, everything that makes up what a human being is, your family, your friends, if all that's been under a massive lie of just our history is being alive, forget all the UFO, you know, well, that's part of our history. It's inextricable. It, you can't separate it. It's woven in like a, a nervous system. You, you can't, you know, that's going to trigger a lot of people more than alien bodies or a crash UFO. They see that every night on Netflix and Star Trek. No, it's when People took your history, your sense of who you are, where you came from, what, you know, you're not an ape. Humans aren't apes. You know, they're not. They're not homosexual. Unbelievable, yeah. They're, that When that's given to us and that's made public as part of disclosure, that will be more significant, I think, than the crashes and the aliens and, oh, we back-engineered a, you know, a plasma cannon. You know, that's sort of like people, you know, but people by and large understand some history and they're like well i know the egyptians and you know, i mean a lot of americans are pretty bad with their history but you're taking away a person's uh, a population of you know, you're taking away and the religious thing is all part of history so that's woven in it's like well sorry you, you know you've been worshiping anunnaki gods and the cosmos in itself is really god or it's female and all you know, all this stuff that's going to be the trigger it's not the alien craft and the bodies and back engineering, I think it's going to be the, the, the history book that's handed by some group of you know, whatever white hats, if you will, and saying, you know, there's be a tall white or somebody blue and they're saying, we love you, but here's your real history. That's going to do it because that touches everyone on the globe. Yeah. You know, yeah. They, they, they lied about who we are and where we came from. The technology is very interesting and very frightening and, and all that stuff. And you know, it's all the dirty laundry is horrible, but it's you're taking away a human beings, you're you're mucking with their soul, their very souls. Interesting. Saying, yeah. Sorry, you've been a prisoner on this wretched planet that was supposed to be a new Eden, but a bad neighborhood grew up around it, and there's a lot of bad actors out there, and we're having to deal with that. You know, that people can understand that because of Star Wars and, and Star Trek and other movies. But when you start saying, well, everything you were taught was a lie in school, wow. that could touch a lot more people than this complex story of back engineering and all that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't, even, you don't even know who you are. You don't know, you know what a soul is. You don't know what gravity is. You don't know what light and, and what electricity really is. The fundamentals, earth, wind, fire, the elementals, you know, 
subtle earth energies, the pyramids, obelisks, uh, megalithic constructions, Stonehenge, you know, that our ancestors used every day because they worked with nature instead of against it. Right. Because we're killing Mother Earth. You know, everyone says she has a soul too. Um, mm -hmm. Man. And this whole thing with Greer says it's bad. Humans bad. E.T. good. That's <sighs> dangerous. And I'm oh, saying, I agree. Yeah. You know, I yeah. like Stephen Greer a lot. I respect him. But that's that's a dangerous narrative. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. you're going to create a massive paradox. I don't know if somebody mucked with him and told him that dog and pony so you know, that ghost story, it's, it's wrong. It doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense throughout history if you do the, you know, we've been fighting nothing but wars. Yeah. Earth, Earth, it's a war zone. It's a war zone. And we're destroying a planet, and planets probably do have souls and Mother Earth and, and Gaia and all that stuff, and we're taking her down with us. That's and you're saying we're being baited Earth. into those wars by something right. else. This is what yeah. Atlantis dealt with, no mm -hmm. doubt. They almost destroyed the earth. They destroyed everything on the surface almost. Yeah. Almost all of it. And so we're we're nearing that again. And you know, that's nothing new. People have been talking about that for forever. But when you when you you know, when most people are like, man, you don't even know who you are, where you came from, what DNA is, what your DNA is, you know, anything, all that stuff. You know, all the elements, you know, the water you drink, you don't even understand what that is. Yeah. That that's energetic, that that has consciousness. Like the Japanese scientist who did water experiments, he he said loving uh, phrases to a, a glass of uh, water and turned it into ice. It was beautiful crystals. Wow. Incredible. Calmed along music, punk music, and then, and, ah, you're a Nazi bastard. Ah! And the water was all convoluted and the ice <laughs> was all... You know, <laughs> geometry nature it's all connected and so we're wow we're letting a minority of bad actors both et and human sorry folks it's just, it doesn't make sense otherwise that's the greek mystery school know thyself right? so uh, you know yeah. i i love greer but he needs he, it's tough criticism it's tough critique it, it's that's a dangerous narrative Oh, yeah, there's something very backward about that and that's the other thing about his show is i met a lot of his people and they were very concerned about that oh yeah they can, interesting he is a granite wall and his ego is taken over and i'm sorry I, it happened he's only human like the rest of us but he's it's he's a granite wall you can't tell him anything and right. that may be part of why uh, certain elements of the government and the ic or everything are worried about him because some of his things are set in stone and they shouldn't be Right. You become married to your own narrative and you don't question anymore. Right. It yeah. is. No, I, I agree with you that that's a, a really dangerous one. It's it's very dangerous, especially going forward with disclosure. Yeah. You're going to be like, well, Greer said it's only humans that are bad. Oh, no. No, no. We learned our dirty tricks and our warlike ways. We're very peaceful and loving human beings. I meet people all the time. Wonderful people. It's only the minority that that think with a, like a binary, you know, militarism, you know, and fascism. Yeah. Oh yeah. That has to come from somewhere. That's just not natural. I know we're duality creatures, but it's like the evidence more than strongly suggests that the ET has been mucking with us to fight wars at their behest as proxies, proxy conflicts. And mm -hmm. this one in Ukraine is no different. Because the Nazis in World War II, they wanted that whole area desperately. It wasn't just oil. They were after other things. I'd write this in my the book, Sanity Was a Luxury. Schaefer and the Anunnaki SS were after something called living water. And I found it in a book. It's an obscure reference. And living water comes from a karst frozen cave in the Alpine regions of the Caucasus. And so apparently it has... If you make it into blood plasma, it has 10 times the healing ability of regular plasma. Oh, interesting. And you can wow. drink it. The word is that Himmler drank it with his tea every day. He was a teetotaler. Like mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things. Obviously, the usual, you know, Anunnaki technology, wherever they could find it. I wrote it. They, they found a Homo Capensis in the Caucasus. He was a, a you know, uh, like a Cossack. And he got a pretty big head, and they're like, "Oh, we found one!" You know, 
they were after all kinds of stuff in that region of the world. It's very mysterious. Wow. You go to Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and the Caucasus region, Georgia, and you see all kinds of strange cities and everything. And, you know, I know there's a big Tartaria movement, uh, but that's overblown. Yes, Tartaria existed and it had flags and everything, but even the ancient maps. Boy, they've taken that over, over the They didn't waterfall. show like, the Wizard of Oz city with free energy and cathedrals, you know, a mile high or something. <laughs> that's been overblown, but... There is something to that region. The Nazis wanted it desperately, and they were interesting. Wow! Out yeah, into Iran, and uh, we had a railway coming up through Iran from the Persian Gulf, supplying. Well, they say everything. they're raising it to the ground on purpose to make it into a smart country, right? It's like the smart city, but they'll make yeah. the whole thing. So that suggests, you know, AI and, and all the you know, deep state programs we've heard of that are nefarious. Yeah, take root there. Uh, but there's something special about that region. Uh, the Nazis mm -hmm. were obsessed with it, even even to the extent where I think maybe Hitler did that terrible mistake of not going to Moscow. He turned his forces south, right, toward Stalingrad and everything like that. The, the Southern movement. This is where General von Manstein, Field Marshal von Manstein, I wrote it in the book, was there with the Gustav gun, Sebastopol, and I have him on the Southern Front lobbing at atomic shells in the book. That southern region going into Georgia and, and uh, the Don River region, they wanted that more than they wanted Moscow, I think, maybe. And so Farrell can chime in on that. But I wonder, they were really, yes, the oil fields of the Caucasus, they didn't quite reach those. But they were after really that those Persian lands, those lands by the Aral Sea and, and all that. They were really, nice. really gunning for that. And the Russians and everybody stopped them. It has to make you wonder what the deal is. Yeah, it's same thing today. What is going on? Ukraine. The Crimea. You know, it, it, they fought wow. the Crimean War. You know, that's another strange war. You know, British attack <laughs> the Turks, you know, the, uh, with the Russians in the mix. And, hmm, you know, did they have their esoteric Freemason scientists like Napoleon had? I, I think in every army, they have groups of those kinds of people like the Ananerbe. We did. Everyone does. That are psychics. They have psychics. They have archaeologists. They have climatologists. They have, you know, primatologists that can understand the ge strange genetics. I think in all wars, going way, way back, even to Alexander the Great, he had teams of people. You know, what can we glean from this? And of course, he he said he's had he's got Anunnaki royal bloodlines going back through his father. And so, wow. yeah, this Napoleon went to Egypt. <laughs> Come on. He didn't want to climb the pyramid. He spent the night in the, in the pyramid chamber. He had an astral. He was psychic. Yeah. He had to be. He was a brilliant commander. Amazing. He had to get everybody against him. And and he was half-hearted about Waterloo anyway. Mm -hmm. He wasn't at his peak. You know, the British needed to stop Napoleon. They didn't want him to upset the apple cart, the status quo apple cart in Europe. Yeah. Luckily, in France, we still have some of his laws and... You know, in other countries, we have bits and pieces of the Napoleonic Code. You know, Napoleon was my hero, man, <laughs> more than Patton now, because Napoleon almost got it done. They have done a revisionist job on him like no one oh, else in history. He's always been pasted as old bony, you know, the little midget and all this stuff, the little corporal. <laughs> he was never a corporal. Folks, he right. was a artillery lieutenant. He was from very fancy bloodlines. Mm -hmm. Rich. But in Corsica, his bloodlines, they go back to Italian royalty. So he had affinity more with, with, with Italy than France. Bosley touts this in his book, but I knew all this beforehand. I think it's pretty interesting timing, too. Yeah. Going after that. Yeah, movies, um, movies and TV shows have been letting out bits and pieces of disclosure if you have the eyes to see it. Like recently in Star Trek, they started talking about dimensions and dimensional travel again and wormholes. And they've always woven that in. And, and, and <laughs> there was something else they did recently on this new series. Uh, it's called Strange New Worlds. Mm -hmm. uh, it, watch it. My advice to everyone is to watch it. It's very good. It's the best thing since the original series in my book. And it lets out certain things if you know what you're looking at. Interesting. Everyone watching this will know. They'll go back and they'll watch and they're like, aha. 
<laughs> they're they're trying to let out some of this greater truth. They oh, Star Trek always has been about that. I fully believe Gene Roddenberry was briefed by Leslie Stevens Jr. and his father, the Admiral. You mm -hmm. know, nine, the East Allen Institute, all of that stuff. And Gene Roddenberry, you know, was given a lot of. It was a. So I mean, Star Trek was way ahead of its time in the 60s. It's incredible. Well, he was channeling and the nine when he died. Coincided right? with the age of Aquarius awakening in the 60s. Yeah, that, it's absolutely. I mean, it's so, it's, even right now, we're still catching up to it. Yeah, it's not a coincidence. All this stuff is, it, it's all starting to come together, you know, you know, for certain nerds like, you know, us doing all this homework. <laughs> you know, it, it's starting to come together. Yeah. But I mean, Napoleon really almost got it done. They had to bring out the Prussians and the, all the British might and, and everything. Um, I just think it's interesting it when you see someone pilloried like that in history to that extent. Yeah. And you're like, this doesn't add up. Doesn't um, add there's, up. There's mystery school activity in France that's thick and heavy. Yeah, and they blame the revolution on him, and that's not true. I mean, he, he did some bloody things with cannons, attacking crowds and everything when he was younger in the revolution. But he was he was he always he always had one eye for the revolution and one eye against it. You know, he was very clever. He played both sides against the middle with Robespierre and, you know, Dan Danton and all those people. Uh, oh, the, the grim, you know, he skirted around that, sort of used it to his advantage. Right. But he wanted that to end. And, and his laws and his science would have revolutionized the world. I think it did revolutionized 19th century science, at least in, the, in Europe, maybe in the United States too, but in secret, you know, yes. the airship Prussians, the Royal Society people looking for strange things in the desert, you know, the people in America with chemical companies and railroad companies and, huh, wouldn't that make, make a great spy aircraft for the Union Army? And those kinds of people who kept all that science, a lot of it, some of it came out, John Worrell Keeley, Jules Verne. Oh, yeah. People wrote about it. I just watched 20,000 Leagues last night again. Oh, I've watched yeah. it in years. And even in the Disney movie, they let out things. He's like, I want to change the world. I want to, you know, and it's like, I wonder in the 19th century if people had access to really good ancient technology or even off world technology, whether or not they did have submarines. And they obviously, I think they had aircraft, the Sonora Air Club. and 1897. There's no thing. question. There Did was a group that had in? access to it. Yeah. yeah. The Nautilus goes underwater and comes up in, into a, a, a lagoon in a volcano. Sounds like Neuschwabenland to me. <laughs> wow. I'm sorry. There's, there's charts where the U boats that are said yeah. to be genuine, the charts that say you need to go this dive to this depth and come up to this depth and turn course and then do this and then you'll end up in a cavern. It's geothermal. Right. That sounds pretty hairy to me as a submarine commander with basic sonar. Uh, mm -hmm. but given all the German technology that's been dug out, I wonder if they had some interesting technology aboard the later U-boats, like the over-unity, uh, several types of over-unity over propulsion. And have, also you ever developed, uh, have you ever developed an idea or a theory about what the Foo Fighters were on the German side during World War II? Well, they weren't German, <laughs> but um, not all of them. Yeah. Uh, the, the the majority of the ones, the Pacific was rife with all this stuff. The Navy was dealing with UFOs popping out of the ocean, all kinds of, uh, of stuff. They were craning saucers out, you know, uh, the Coral Sea while under Japanese attack. I mean, some of it was off world. Some of it may have been um, an inner earth folks. That's a possibility. I'm not going to rule that out. Coming mm -hmm. up to what's what's going on with these surface idiots? Oh mm -hmm. my god, they got atomic bombs and off-world people coming on. Oh no, no, they're ripping through the dimensions with these Gustav shells, you know, going in, in the Russian lines, blowing up. The possibilities are endless. But one consensus I can gather from everything I studied about Foo Fighters is every side thought they were there were the others. Interesting. And there's talk of a about a Japanese, not only a nuclear program, but also a, a a secret space program in its embryonic stages. Mm -hmm. The Germans at the end were giving them some jets and some uranium and some other things by U-boat. A lot of those U-boats were sunk. 
But um, hmm. you could postulate that they were, well, the Germans gave us some blueprints. Now, how we're going to build that at Mitsubishi and, you know, Arisaka or whatever, the, the corporations, I'm not sure. I don't think they were anywhere near the Germans as far as the technology. But, boy, uh, had the war gone on another three or four years, uh, we would have seen all Incredible. kinds of things going on. Uh, wow. Wow. Wunderwaffer weapons, and it, it, it might have gone horrendously wrong. And maybe there's a timeline out there like Man in the High Castle where the Japanese and Germans did win. That's a weird, you know, <sighs> Philip K. Dick was definitely tapped into the universe. He was a smart guy. His books are incredible. Oh, he's, and, yeah, uh, he's psychically gifted. Yeah. They, that. People, um, or he was in the room with some talk with people who knew some things about, you know, the universe. Well, he had his men in black experiences. Yeah. That's what's sure. interesting. Uh, so he was harassed. But it is interesting when you get to that level of looking at it, because even after the war, what you get in America are those two sides, basically the Nazi side and the communist side, barbing again, vying for power behind the scenes. And uh, it is the paperclip side that becomes a dominant force. Yeah. Amazing. I John, incredible, just incredible overview here. And uh, now we're all looking forward to Sanity as a Luxury coming out. This promises to be a powerful novel uh, dealing with some of these X technology themes in a very deep way. Before you're done today, and what would you like to leave our viewers with on the subject of real versus false UFO disclosure? I'll end on, on the thing is people are like, oh, this Grush thing is disclosure. And I'm like, what disclosure? It's just the same old stories. No I don't question. see any, anything new, really. You know, they, they, they talk a lot. It's much ado about very little, all of this. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Not, it's not nothing, much ado about nothing. It's much ado about very little. Mm -hmm. If you add it all up, it has the impression of disclosure. Eh, you lift the lid off and it's like, mm, it's just a little bit of a paper tiger in there. Um, some sort of... Uh, this is the question, which is why they're trying to roll this kind of false version out. What if the real thing shows up? Well, that's the wild card. Because if E.T. says, enough of this nonsense, and they come out, again, will people believe it? If you get 10 tall whites and a blue guy up there from Andromeda on, on CNN, will people even believe that? Right, they might think, hey, it's like a, it's a robotic cyborg. Yeah, you you got to put it's a whole thing. I, even if you have the presidents and the joint chiefs and all, you know, lots of generals and admirals and some ETs, you'll get some eyeballs on that. But again, you're dealing, you're mucking with people's reality that they've been taught this is nonsense for so many decades. Mm -hmm. Young young people won't have a problem, but some of the older people might. Um, you know, you're you're gonna. Man, you're lighting on fire the, the, the tail of the dragon. I mean, you're giving him a hot foot. Um, it, there's so many ways to go. Wow, they, yeah. They, they've long time passed. They've missed the, the window of opportunity to do this in an adult, meaningful, slow and methodic and, and well thought out way. Because all this stuff so far has not been that well thought out. TTSA, junk. Tom DeLong, janky as hell. I mean, you know, a guy who takes ecstasy and rides a skateboard at, at his advanced age, he asked Dr. Greer that. I mean, this guy's a well about, guy. He likes UFOs and he, he's, he's a Freemason. You know, he's got the symbols. Oh, that's and, right. Yeah. Hey, what about Dr. They, Fauci's pal, Gary Nolan, though? Why would they pick him? It's so weird. It's like all these nerdy, dorky CIA people got in the rooms. What should we do? Oh, let's get a punk rock guy. Okay, he likes UFOs. That sounds great. Go get him, Chris Mellon. And I'll get, what about what about our our hero for GQ and the papers? Well, we'll get a military guy. You know, it'll be you know, you know, counterintelligence guy. That's <laughs> real. I know. Blue is strong. Yeah. Most of Twitter love him. They they hate it when you come out. And they'll they'll land base you. You know, it's just like he. People need, there's a primal need to uh, not only obey authority, but to trust authority. Mm. And Lou and 
Chris, and all those people are scientists, they're government and CIA people, they're officials. Right. And that's our big, this is the, the public angle of this. It's they've got the title, they've got the credentials. They've got the credentials, which are meaningless. You might as well play Monopoly with that kind of money. You know, but it's, you know, yeah. to, to the general public, you know, everyone's like, why are you so mean to your cousin? He, he, he worked, you know, for the government. And I'm like, that's the problem. You know? <laughs> Put but two and two together. Wow. This is, this is a real issue of people's, you know, it's a primal thing that's been ingrained in us, I think, for thousands of years. Trust your overseers. Trust your betters. Trust the royals. Trust your Anunnaki overlords. Trust the government. Trust the million. We've been, it's been bred into us on probably the DNA level. It's probably, you know, that's why they turned off 10 strands of our 12 strand DNA, probably, is because right. the ability to think for oneself, you know, a lot of the new age people, I listen to everyone, try to gain knowledge, not be too stuck in my groove. And they say, you know, the people waking up, they're activating one or two further strands of their DNA naturally. It's a natural evolutionary process. So I hope that's the case because, you know, going forward, uh, they've missed the opportunity where there's not going to be upheaval and, and violence and disruption. True. No matter how you slice this, I, I wish I could come up with something better. They just missed the chance. And... Um, you know, you could do it slow, but if you do it too slow, like I said, Russia and China and England or France, India, they'll do it for you. In a heart. This is the danger. Yeah, it is. To mess with us. Even Japan, I mean, and there's there's talk about people getting off the dollar, you know, as a, you know, you, yeah. America, we're tired of you swinging your big stick around and doing all these janky wars. And, and, and but they've got their own moon. Uh, yeah, yeah. projects going on. They're going to the moon. They have their own manned missions that are ready. Oh, I'm you sure know. they want a slice of our real estate. You know. <laughs> Apparently the moon's very crowded. And, you know, the backside looks like Manhattan at night. Uh, <laughs> people tell stories that have been on the moon. They said, I've worked on the moon base. It's very yeah. crowded. You do not cross over into someone else's territory. It's neutral ground, mm -hmm. you know, that was put in our atmosphere, you know, in Atlantis times, there were two moons because one was an energy reflector for the two eye stone or whatever. And that was artificial. And our moon was brought here, not to balance the earth, but, but as a, as a, as a place for ET to study the growth, their projects. So oh, we did the human project. Nah, that's a little weird. The Anunnaki did that. Screw them. Uh, but the palm trees and, and the, you know, the, the, the megafauna and, and all that stuff. And the, you know, Silicanth and you know they all did their projects and then you know they have it's like we go to another country we have an embassy there and we keep an eye on you know our folks that are expats in, in, in the country or whatever doing jobs same thing mm -hmm. the moon is just a giant embassy that's multiple it's like the, it's not really the United Nations there's not a lot of there's some probably some negotiations going on there but it's originally it's a place the lore says that it, it it's a place where ET and, and human can come together and, you know, in a neutral ground. And That's so why it well, makes sense. The whole rumor about the idea that we were kicked off the moon uh, originally and that yeah. we were warned off it sort of makes sense now when well, you think about it. The Apollo program in my, in my thinking, the Apollo program uh, did that and they were trying to do another operation, but the, um, you know, some other corporations or other thing, they're the ones who did the moon base and probably got a lease on it or something like that. You know, remember, America is not all on board with one another. We're, we've been factions always, but in this new technology, ET uh, UFO technology, the factions don't know what the other factions are doing. Wow. The NSA could be on the moon with their own project. Oh, we're doing it with the, you know, the green people. Uh, Excellent point. Wow. People. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. no. And no one knows because even William Tompkins mentions that in his book. He said the Apollo program kept going, but it was serving corporations, not NASA or the American people. Oh, I think he got that right. Yeah. yeah. So I think our solar system, you know, they might as well have billboards and, you know, all the corporations you see on Earth, you know, they might as well, they got signs on moons. Hey, uh, 
Raytheon owns this. Don't come near us. You know, it's probably like that. The corporatization of space is already ongoing. Wow. And, uh, Gigantic privatized space. What was program. Solar Warden? What was the U.S. Navy guarding in the solar system? Right. Yeah, colonies on moons and things where corporations were setting up colonies for their workers and, and they were mining, a lot of mining, probably. What else is out there? Well, technology, you can drill for that. You know, you can scour. Apparently everyone does that. It's like Star Wars. You know, they're all finding junk and mm -hmm. junk. You know, like the girl does. You know, there's a lot of that going on probably. And, you know, minerals and wealth. I mean, sky's the limit. Wow. Who knows what Europa has, <laughs> you know, right. as well as life forms, you know, fish, you know, oh, we found a hundred foot tuna. Holy shit. Japanese will be going crazy for that one. Bring back the Europa tuna. You know, they got a hundred foot big as a whale, but it's, you know, ahi tuna. What about the obelisk on Phobos? The yeah. And then the price of tuna goes down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. We need inflation again. Someone print some more money. You know, it, yeah, it's, it's very complicated, but I'm fully convinced corp the corporatization of space was started long ago. Wow. We should do – Rick tried to show us in 2001. Come on. We should do an episode just on that sometime. I would love to do that oh, man. because it's that is 2001, yeah. <laughs> John, it's great. <laughs> it's been great uh, to have you go over this whole thing, and we're going to have you back on – while all this stuff is going on and they're pushing Grush and all the rest of it, I think it's great to have you out there as this counter voice really opening things up around what's actually happening there, especially since, you know, it is Chris Mellon, after all, who's behind so many of the machinations here. Yeah, I mean, I want to reiterate that I, it's not a bad thing. They're talking about the subject, but I'm not, you know, 100% against it. it is, the more, the merrier, because going forward, it's like everyone do everything. You know, whether it's janky or not, it's just more because it's more exposure, you know, things like that. So, you know, we'll see what happens with it. Uh, this one's going to be a wild ride, but I think there's a lot of deception going on with the Grush thing. That's the problem. And also, I think a lot of that tap dancing that's going on on the Intel side is, is problematic. But uh, it is interesting because... I think that uh, you're right that there's more there than meets the eye and maybe almost accidentally they're going to do some good <laughs> by well, getting the possibility. I want to give you know Chris and everybody credit. I'm not just a naysayer that, you know, right. No, you're very fair. About that. Say, you're just trying to ride his coattails. I'm like to hell, <laughs> you know, <laughs> ride his coattails where? I don't want to be him, you know, but they're doing things, something, I think, it's always something, but not very concrete. But at least they're doing something. I think they really do want uh, to move this narrative along, but they want their version to take root, not our version and the disclosure. Mm -hmm. But I think that's too late. It's too late to do that. Interesting. Wow. Uh, right. Well, we'll be looking for it. And uh, <laughs> as usual, it's fantastic to have you on. Well, thanks for having me on. It's good to it's good to vent, you know. <laughs> exactly. Good to vent over. That was great information. <laughs> exactly. Cosmic Martini Hour with what, what is uh, the guy on uh, HBO? What is it? Uh, Bill Maher. He does oh, yeah. lounge. You know, they, they're just. Oh, drink. that's right. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> with the lighting and all the rest of it. Yeah, I kind of like that. You should do that. You know, <laughs> structureless lounge, and you just <laughs> some couches, and you know, you know that. The, what is it? The mid-century modern lighting and the whole exactly. thing, smoking jackets, and yeah. the show gets so strange as it is that that would just knock it into a whole different place. But uh, yeah, I totally agree. Well, I don't know. It might be it might be a good idea. Ask Olivia. She'll. John, just great. And we look very much forward uh, to having you back on the show in 2024. Now, uh, here are some thoughts that I had on my call with David Grush, the UFO whistleblower, in a very long but somewhat dissatisfying on the transparency side uh, call with Grush, who calls himself a UFO whistleblower. Let's listen in. So the very day that that whole thing happens, I get contacted by David Grush and he wants to have an off the record conversation. 
which is fine because that's the kind of thing that I've offered to all of those people involved on the Intel side when they wanted to go and push this uh, UFO thing since the 2017 New York Times article. The problem with that level of um, putting things out about the UFO file has always been that the people involved, like Elizondo, like Mellon, didn't have disclosure in mind. They were part of an op to hide things relating to the UFO file and to bring out a false version of disclosure. This is why, uh, you know, I and a series of other people have done reports on them, exposing the public lies involved there. Now, Grush was interesting because uh, he came forward and they did this kind of fast track through Congress. They had him up there talking a mile a minute, and then he didn't know what to say because what you could say in the skiff, what you could say in other places. Now, here's what's interesting. And, you know, the, the conversation that I had with him was off the record, so I'll leave it off the record because you know, that's the way he wanted it. That's fine. And I gave him the opportunity to come on the show fully expecting, you know, tough questions. And um, as I've invited any of those people involved in the op to come on this show. And uh, I think the problem with the others involved is that they realized, oh, you yeah. know, Within a couple of minutes, this is not going to be, you know, sort of a George Knapp, Chris Cuomo, scratch my back conversation. You know, uh, is it hard to be a hero or a legend? <laughs> One of those. So um, I think that, that those people looking at this show have said, oh, you know, we're never going to get past that. But Grush was different in this sense that he wanted to uh, reach out and talk about that. And all I can say, you know, in relation to Grush is, you know, I gave him advice, which was um, the people that you're surrounded with around this, like Mellon, like Elizondo, that's not helping your story. And if so, if your story is legit, then those aren't the people who, you know, they've already tried to sham the public in the last five years. So my message basically, you know, that's the advice that I gave him. And um, I hope that he takes it and he's welcome to come on this show and speak about the issues of the things that he's trying to reveal. Uh, but the, the thing is, in relation to it, he's going to face the same questions that they would have faced. So you have to be ready for that because this show is not about, you know, it's not a News Nation fluff job. You're going to get real questions because we know about the real UFO file. And if you're bringing forward real information and if you're at odds with that government system, um, then it's going to be a real conversation. Uh, if it's you know, an Elizondo, hey, you know, here's my great book and I'll, maybe I'll tell you about this. Maybe I'll raise my eyebrow when you mention dead bodies or something, uh, dead alien bodies. You know, that's, you know, that's not what this is about. This is not the kind of, you know, TTSA, George Knapp junk that they try to pull on us. So I always say in relation to these people, if you want to have a gentleman's debate, you're welcome anytime to come on this show and talk about it. and uh, But nonetheless, it was an interesting uh, week. And you might say, Miss Olivia, that was some timing. Mm -hmm. Let's think about that. So, or um, sus timing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, what I can say is remarkably, I, you know, the Tucker interview with Grush and along with the Rogan one, these are not, you know, it's like they don't know anything about the subject. And I'm happy for them to you know study this stuff and use it in their conversations because um that's not an arrogant thing but to just sit there and kind of um fluff the person who's talking doesn't make any any sense you know there's a lot of steps involved in the ufo file and the secrecy that's kept with it and you have to be able to separate people who are intel agents that are pushing an intel theme from genuine whistleblowers and uh, so that's what we plan to do on this show. I'll, I'll follow up a little more uh, with that in the Q&A section. But boy, it was it was interesting. And uh, as I've said, uh, you know, I'm, in the case of Grush, he's welcome to come on this show and tell you exactly um, what he is talking about. And outside of the influence of Mellon or Elizondo or any of those people who have lied in public, you know, and that's the problem. Because when you get around people like that and they say it's guilt by association, but there's a there's a taint <laughs> of the intel groups and the lies that they've tried to put out with the UFO disclosure piece that might be totally separate from what he's saying, but he's going to have to do the separating. And that's the kind of level of advice that I give. 
And that about sums up my thoughts on the UFO whistleblower David Grush. It's important who you keep company with, and there's no real way around that. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Great things coming up in 2024. I'll be back with you next week with Miss Olivia and our wonderful guests. To all of you in the Dark Journalist Ideas Room, have a happy, healthy, and wonderful new year, and we'll see you soon.